Hello, everyone. Bonjour, hola. My name is Erica Di Ruggiero. I'm the editor in chief for Global Health Promotion, and it's my pleasure to introduce um, our guest speakers today and also to acknowledge my uh, co moderator who will take over um, sort of halfway through the program, and that's Professor Diane Levin Zamir, who's with the University of Haifa School of Public Health and is also an associate editor with Global Health Promotion. Um, for those of you who don't know me, in addition to being the editor-in-chief for Global Health Promotion, I am also an associate professor of global health at the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. And this is where I'm joining you from, uh, from Toronto, Canada, or Takaranto, which is for thousands of years, the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. This meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are very grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. So in terms of how the program will unfold, um, I'm going to briefly introduce um, the focus of today. This is part two in a series that we've been running of webinars focused on our collection titled Health Promotion Perspectives on the COVID-19 Pandemic. Um, so some of you will recall that we issued a call for papers last April in conjunction with Health Promotion International, another health promotion journal, focused on the key question, how is the health promotion community affected by and also responding to this unprecedented global challenge? And we got a, an overwhelming response, over 170 proposals for articles, and we worked with Health Promotion International to decide which subset of papers and commentaries would be accepted. And we're delighted to have had the opportunity to publish 48 papers in Global Health Promotion, 33 in English, nine in Spanish, and six en français. And I'd also just like to uh, acknowledge one of the guest editors who was pulled in to help um, with this special collection, Paula Aldilis, who particularly helped us with the Spanish language papers. Um, you'll, um, if you've had a chance to peruse or read um, some of these papers, uh, the collection I think represents um, a really good regional mix from not just Latin America, but also North America, Africa, the Middle East and Europe. And we've published now two special issues, both in March and June, including many of the papers that you'll hear about today. And we're delighted that many world renowned scholars and as well as emerging scientists and practitioners and professionals in health promotion took the opportunity to share their findings and reflections and insights on a variety of health and social related issues that were raised or actually, I think more importantly, amplified because many of these were pre existing inequities that were already um, operating well before the pandemic. So um, I'm going to um, now um, turn it over to our first speaker and just um, I'll introduce each speaker in turn. Um, so our first speaker who's doing double duty today is Professor Diane Levin Zamir and um, I've already briefly introduced um, her but she's also the National Director of the Department of Health Education and Promotion um, at Klatt Elite Health Services in Israel and also an associate professor in the School of Public Health at the University of Haifa in Israel. And she plays many other roles, um, including associate editor with Global Health Promotion. She's also a member of the Global Working Group on Health Literacy um, and Leadership uh, for IUHPE, and is also the chair um, of the National Council on Health Promotion uh, for Israel's Ministry of Health. So she's clearly a very, very busy person. And so we're really delighted that she could join us today. She is a co-author of a paper titled Health Promotion Preparedness for Health Crises, a must or a nice to have case studies and global lessons learned from the COVID pandemic. So I'll turn things over to you, Diane, to give us a, a short presentation, and then Thank we'll you. proceed with the next present, uh, presenters. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Erica, and nice to see you all. I'm just going to repeat the instructions. If any of you uh, still have the name Alexandra on your screen, and if you're not Alexandra, you're invited to rename yourself with three dots at the top right, so we can see your names and we can see who's here. But it's just nice to see so many people have joined. I'm just gonna share my screen and just going to see if, um, 
have I, able if someone could just nod and let me know if you're seeing my screen right now. Yes. Okay, thanks. So it's just a pleasure to be here. I'm very honored, firstly, and very grateful that our, um, our manuscript was accepted and that we were able to publish in this very important series. And I'm very honored to represent a, a great group of people who work together um, for promoting health literacy, for promoting health promotion. And some together, we founded the Global Working Group on Health Literacy of the IUHP. And it's an active group and you're welcome to join and to share in um, the, the investment that we have to promote health. So um, I'd like to just, you know, this it is a long list of authors and I just would like to give you just an example, uh, just share with you how this came about before we go into it. Uh, interestingly, we, at the beginning of the pandemic last year, uh, so many of us, maybe like so many of you were working on our own in health promotion, asking ourselves, what is our, what is our job now? What should we be doing? Everything has changed so much in public health. And are we still essential? And we began developing our own protocols for health promotion and we began speaking to each other. And we realized that there's a really room for collective experience for us to understand each other's experience to learn because there was no precedent for how to work in health promotion during a health crisis. So that was setting the stage and that's kind of behind the scenes. I could actually put a roller coaster here because from a lockdown to lockdown and from surge to surge in your countries as well, things change pretty dramatically. But the way in which we looked at it, um, this is the uh, group of champions, which I'm so happy to acknowledge. Um, these were the leaders of most of the sections of the papers you can see coming from different parts of the world. And actually what we did was when we saw our experience, we saw that we really looked for, we needed for a model. So in this presentation, I'll give you a really short synopsis of our article. Of course, I invite you to, to read the article. It's very rich in experience. We decided that we're going to collectively look at our case studies from the different countries. Of course, we began in the first lockdown and then things changed by the time we submitted, by the time we received reviews, by the time we revised, things are changing all the time. So this is a snapshot of what we could see there may be the average part of, of the pandemic. So I will present the, the model that we used to be able to put our collective experience together uh, from different countries. So you'll see, I'll keep you in suspense. I will not be presenting all of the case studies in detail, but just some of the learning experiences. And of course, some conclusions and recommendations for all of us working in health promotion, whether we're researchers, whether we're practitioners, or whether we're policymakers, or whether we're all of the above. So we decided when we saw our collective experience, we thought that this would really be very be appropriate for us to look at the socio-ecological model, which many of you know, uh, because we saw that there was a, a wide variety and diverse aspects of health promotion being implemented, but we saw that it really fit into the different layers of the health uh, of the um, socioeconomic model. So you, you know the model, most of you, you have the original reference. And then what we saw was that when we mapped out our experiences, we saw that it really, as I mentioned, fit. But what we wanted to do, and this is what we were set out to do as a group, and it turned into an article, was that we wanted to learn from our collective experience and see what could be shared. As I mentioned, this was a precedent time. There was really no, no other experience we could learn from. So we realized we were creating the evidence. So um, the first case study that I'd like to highlight is came from our colleague in Germany, from Melanie Messer. Um, and it was looking at what was being done and what needed to be done with older people. Many of you in your countries saw that the older people, on the one hand, were more vulnerable for, for, for COVID, uh, 19 and on the other hand though they would be isolated and to the extent of loneliness and we know that that takes a very uh that's they pay a high price for their health so um in in the article which i invite you to read um you'll see the different experiences the different interventions that uh, melanie mentions that took place but the most important things and that's what we're going to be seeing for all the case studies which i'll present now are the lessons learned so the importance of relatives and home care services and nursing homes for preventing and containing the spread of infection is really, really critical. Also, we realize that there's measures needed to shift from, to a more patient-centered health promotion and to community health support and to have appropriate health information interventions based on health literacy appropriate for older people. 
And also we need, we saw we needed new measures to improve living and working conditions. And we saw that even those who were working with the older people needed to be protected and have uh, social participation and empowered for better coping. So this was the first level that you could see for interpersonal care for and interpersonal interventions for health promotion during COVID for older people. So then we'll go on to the next layer of the socioeconomic model and we looked at the organization. And here, Dr. Jill Rollins from Newcastle University, who is chair, of the Global Working Group on Health Literacy shared with us in the article uh, the way in which in, in the UK mental health promotion was given attention and through the, the, the primary care system during COVID period. Of course, as everything else that we'll be mentioning, the needs were evident very quickly and then there was lessons learned. And she, in, the, in the article, you will, expo you will hear um, in the article, you will hear that there has been, there is uh, a very rich uh, experience at how mental health was given attention to. And so I won't go into it here. I will again, keep you in suspense. But what was learned was that the embedded health inequalities really, really were so evident so strongly and they were exacerbated by COVID. Uh, increased readiness to discuss mental health and illness and that and mental health literacy becomes it's become an issue. Increasing understanding of the interplay of physical and mental and social health, realizing we, what we all know, but it was really came to front during the pandemic. The question of mental health stigma. Uh, how do, what is our language about talking about health? Are, are we um, labeling people? Are we allowing people to to have with mental health issues to express themselves. And in the article, you see the interventions that really promoted this issue and the need for working across wider society, not just health services. So going on, we see, and this is the different, uh, just example of the different uh, organizations that need to partner because we have to look for stakeholders. So in addition, we're going further and we're looking at community health. Uh, I just want to make sure you're hearing me uh, because my speakers change in the middle. So if uh, anybody can just signal if you're if you're not hearing me, you won't be able to signal. But if someone can just give me some signal that um, I'm coming through, I'd be happy to know that as I keep talking. So um, organizational health literacy, uh, sorry, organizational health promotion um, through schools. Uh, we've been we're seeing that actually have um, a tremendous. Um, needs that were evidenced. There's here Dr. Orkan, Orkan from Bielefeld University in Germany and supported by Dr. Luisa Boga Yunis, uh, two very active members of the Global Working Group on Health Literacy and also active in salutogenesis and health promotion in general. In the article, they gave us the experience of what, uh, what was realized in, in, uh, in Germany and beyond. So what were the lessons learned? Educational systems we saw in many of our countries were not well prepared enough to respond to the pandemic and need to redesign the health system, the education system, to provide more inclusive and health literate system equipped to include health promotion. We realize that working parents are at a disadvantage many times because, in, and often in, in many of the families, because they were not able to be at home with kids who had to be at home and support them while they were working on the digital communication and learning. Uh, we realized that there are a lot of families that don't have the digital infrastructure at home and what were the kids to do then? Was this something that their needs were going to be met? Was anybody actually going to expose this issue? So these, these issues really came to the front and needing new educational approaches uh, for, for and practical methods that are adapted to this period of time. And I think so many of our countries have come forward, but so many of the needs are still incredibly uh, there and, need, and we need to close the disparities. And just going further, um, now we're, we're at the policy issue, the policy level of the socio-ecological uh, model. And here, our colleague, uh, Dr. Tintin Su from Malaysia, uh, shared with us the experience in Malaysia for working with migrant workers and vulnerable populations in Singapore and Malaysia. And she explains in the article the ways in which the challenges that they experienced and the ways in which they were able to meet at least partially the challenges, but what were the lessons learned? The importance of policies, promoting health promotion messages and physical distancing, which we're using now, not social distancing, using per, uh, personal protection equipment, and particularly masks and good hygiene. Policies were needed to take into consideration 
uh, the environment supporting health literacy across populations, especially those who are most marginalized and most vulnerable. And finally, I'm happy to share uh, an experience in Israel, and we're looking at the cross-cutting levels of the social ecolo ecological model and the systems approach. And I'll just quickly mention, uh, many of you follow what's going on in Israel because uh, the way in which we uh, went forward with vaccination, but even before that, uh, we tried to do as much as possible, uh, work and in, in, in close the gaps in health promotion, health literacy action, and providing reliable, useful, and accessible culturally appropriate information, which we did not have available before, give feedback to government officials on clear and health promoting language, uh, when to use which language for the public, health literacy and advocacy, approaching government and religious leaders, asking them to take into consideration the public need and not just political needs, shifting hundreds of group promotion health promotion programs that we had on a national level to going into uh, uh, digital uh, cultural appropriateness and all action, especially during religious holidays. And also social media and infodemics. We're really fighting um, vaccine resistance through infodemics. And there's some opportunities that we've had, the silver lining as we call it. Um, what we've been left with is, for example, health promoting quarantine hot hotels for all of you who are in health promotion and settings. It's a new health promotion setting. And the emergence of online health self-help groups and partnership with health professionals. And finally, digital solutions for health promotions, particularly for seniors, which before and thought that they were not able to um, to work in digital uh, in di digital systems as much. And that was another stigma that we were able to hopefully um, reduce and also the public at large. And just happy to say, just share a little bit of data. Um, one year after we began, uh, we have seen that we have more than um, 358 workshops, health promotion workshops we've been able to implement with more than 2,430 group meetings, over 4,000 different participants in the typical health promotion topics that you're all aware of, but we decided that we weren't going to let COVID get in and away. So the, the, our digital system using Microsoft Teams has been allowing us to, to take it forward and it's been a learning experience for the public and for us as well. So our lessons learned was that we need comprehensive national policy for health promotion preparedness for a health crisis, which we did not have, and we still don't have enough of the policies in place, including health literacy interventions, public participation, and partnership, and it's all very essential. So in conclusion, I will not read this table to you, but it's in the article. You can see according to the different um, different countries and different case studies that I mentioned, we analyze them according to needs and according to implications for research, practice, and policy. And so our main recommendations are for, for health promotion preparedness as Definitely give attention to equity, which we know has been neglected in so many countries. Build public trust, which we, again, we realize this is critical for being able to have cooperation with the public. We need a systems approach, which is that need to us. So it's putting Ottawa in, in place. The Ottawa Charter is really relevant here and also have sustained action, not just one off and not just up and down as, as the lockdowns go up and down. So our future challenges are building best practices and investing resources in health promotion. We need to focus on health literacy because that was one of the tools we had for convincing the public to make changes, to gather valid and reliable data and evidence for health promotion solutions and prepare for expected future challenges. We're not over it yet. Um, in Israel, we'll be getting maybe our fourth uh, wave, even though we've been over 80% of the, of the older public is, is vaccinated. And I think everyone's looking to us to see what's going to happen uh, for vaccination. Do we need a third acceleration or not? Who needs it? And how long will it be effective for? So we're going to continue this conversation. I'm also inviting you all to join us at uh, the first global summit on health literacy. IUHP is a full partner in, in, this, um, in this summit, and we're going to continue the conversation there. So please, um, Make note of the uh, website and we look forward to seeing you there. And thank you so much for your attention. I look forward to hearing the rest of the presentations here. That's great. Thanks so much, Diane, for presenting a very uh, comprehensive overview of many uh, case studies. I think one of the key messages I also took away, in addition to the ones that you highlighted, was despite the heterogeneity of the different contexts that you looked at, there were some persistent themes. And I think it underscores the importance of 
albeit the challenges of doing cross uh, country comparative work using uh, case studies and the importance of learning also in real time, despite the challenges of doing that. So thanks so much. And everyone on, um, on the webinar uh, who just joined us, welcome. Um, we've just finished with the first presenter and I would just encourage you to start thinking about any questions you may have, you can use the chat or when we get to that part of the discussion, we can also uh, take the questions live. So without further ado, I'll just um, next proceed to our next presenter and that's Dr. Adi Mana. And, um, and Dr. Mana is an educational psychologist and a senior lecturer at the School of Behavioral Health Sciences in Perez Academic Center in Israel. Her research focuses on the encounter between the personal and the collective in the context of intergroup relationships in situations of conflict and crisis. And Dr. Mana is a member of the Global Working Group on Salutogenes um, of the IUHPE. And she co-authored a paper entitled Individual Social and National Coping Resources and Their Relationships with Mental Health and Anxiety. Um, we have a bit of a theme here, a comparative study in Israel, Italy, Spain, and the Netherlands during uh, the pandemic. So I'll turn things over to you, Dr. Mana, for your remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Erika. Um, I'm very, very happy, very proud to be with you in this webinar. Uh, I will share the screen with you. Okay, can you see it? Yes. Okay. okay, so in my short talk, I would like to share with you the results of a cross-sectional uh, international study and a longitudinal study that explored the role of individual social and national coping resources in promoting mental health and reducing general anxiety during the COVID-19 pandemic. So as you all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has created a chaos and changed the predictable reality and our regular way of life. The pandemic started from a sudden spread of the virus around the, ro the world, created acute stress and high level of anxiety and changed to a long period of stress and struggling with the virus. And actually we still do not know when and where the virus will attack and what damage it will cause in the short and long term. Since the pandemic is characterized by waves of fast growing numbers of confirmed uh, COVID-19 cases, increased death, feeling losing control, and a rigid uh, restriction that slowly eased until the next wave began rising. And this situation uh, demanded a continuing effort on individual, social, and national level to find a way of, to live with the pandemic waves. So our question was, um, how do people struggle with the COVID-19 and remain mentally healthy? And based on the study's results that I will uh, present uh, uh, here, I would like to describe the long-term effect of living with the COVID-19 waves and the coping resources predicted mental health and anxiety. The research product project was coordinated by me and Professor Shifa Sagi. Uh, 10 countries participate in, uh, participated in this study. Uh, our colleagues, uh, our researcher, who are member of the Salutogenic Global Working Group in the IOHP. Additional longitudinal study conducted in Israel by me and Shifa, starting from the breakdown of the pandemic and including five phases of the crisis. The data were collected via online survey. The study is based on the salutogenic approach developed by uh, Aaron Antonovsky. This approach was mainly focused on the question why, when people are exposed to the same stress, some became ill and some remain healthy. Antonovsky's main answer to this question lies in his core const uh, construct, sense of coherence. Sense of coherence is defined as a global perception uh, of the world, perceiving it as manageable, comprehensible, and meaningful. Manageability is related to the degree to which we might feel that we have the ability to cope with challenge, to solve problem, 
the belief that we can manage this problem. We have individual, social, national resources that are needed to manage this pandemic successfully. Comprehensibility refers to the extent to which we perceive what is happening around us and also what is happening inside us in our inner world as rational. The ability to understand, to find order, to see things as coherent, clear and constructed can help us cope. Disability is not measured by the kind of knowledge uh, that we have. For example, if is it a conspiracy theory uh, or a, a, a scientific theory, but the way this knowledge help us to understand or to believe that we understand what is happen, uh, uh, happening around us. And meaningful, meaningfulness refers to the feeling that our life and our experience have some meaning. That, for example, for this global crisis can teach us something. This unique experience uh, has some purpose. Um, and all this um, uh, dimension of sense of coherence, uh, um, um, this is the three dimension of sense of coherence. And according to, to uh, Antonovsky, sense, sense, sense of coherence uh, um, is a core coping resource that helps the individual to identify and mobilize relevant resources to cope with stressor and manage tension successfully, and therefore to increase mental health and decrease uh, anxiety. So, uh, according to the salutogenic hypothesis, we can expect that during this, this stressful period, adults, if I continue to this uh, uh, um, slide, adults with a strong sense of coherence can find the proper coping resources in their surrounding and use them more efficiently, and by that to promote their mental health and decrease the level of anxiety. So in this uh, uh, study, we tested this hypothesis and we explore, explore the relationship between the dependent variable of mental health and general anxiety and uh, individual coping uh, resource of sense of coherence, social coping resources of perceived social support from family, community, virtual community. We also explore national coping resources of trust in government and authorities that are in charge of managing the pandemic, and sense of national coherence that defined as the enduring tendency to perceive the national group as comprehensible, meaningful, and manageable. We tested and controlled this uh, situation, situational and pathog pathogenic variables, such as level of health risk and exposure to coronavirus, level of financial risk and other social demographic variables that were found in former studies to be relevant, such as gender, education, marital status, and voting pattern. So try to answer two questions. What promote mental health and reduce anxiety during the COVID-19 pandemic? And what can we learn about longitudinal coping process um, evolving from the acute uh, acute uh, to chronic stressful event. Since I have very, very limited time, I will only share with you the main result. You are invited to receive the full manuscript by writing to my email. So to answer the first question, uh, um, we conducted separate, a separate hierarchical regression uh, to test the role of coping resources risk factor and demographic variable in predicting mental health and anxiety. The level of overall regression model predicted more than 50% of the variance of ment in mental health and anxiety scores. And as you can see, among all the other var variables, sense of coherence was the main predictor of mental health and anxiety. You can see here the table of anxiety. And this finding confirmed the central role Antonovsky assigned to the sense of coherence as a universal core and major coping resource, not limited by cultural and situational characteristics. According to the assumption uh, that strong sense of coherence allow one to be flexible, 
and to reach out to the uh, proper resources in one surrounding, we also explore a mediating model uh, in which passive social support mediate and trust mediated the relationship between sense of coherence and mental health after controlling level of age, gender, and exposure, exposure to risk factor. And the model was confirmed in all the uh, uh, different countries. So it seems that COVID-19 uh, COVID period, people with stronger sense of coherence could reach out for more support from their close and distant social circles and uh, therefore to maintain their mental health. And what about the longitudinal effects of COVID-19? When we look at, at the longitudinal study conducted in Israel in five phases, we found that while level of mental health and coping resource of perceived social support, trust, sense of national coherence significantly and gradually decreased, uh, uh, decreased from the first phase to the next four phases of data collection, the level of sense of coherence remains stable along the five recent stages of data collection. In addition, people uh, who reported on higher level of sense of coherence during the outbreak of the pandemic, the acute st uh, uh, stage, have a higher level of mental health at the end of the year of the pandemic. The, the person correlation was very, were very strong uh, um, 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 uh, was uh, 0.50. So what can we learn from this study? COVID-19 provides us a unique opportunity to understand how people from different countries and cultural contexts struggle with the same stressor, a difficult pandemic. Overall, our resolve confirmed Antonovsky's hypothesis that personal a construct of sense of coherence is a universal protective factor that contributes to affecting uh, coping with stressor and promote health. Even in, in time of widespread health crisis uh, uh, like the COVID-19 pandemic, strong sense of coherence uh, in stressful period allow one to be flexible and reach out for the appropriate resources in his or her surrounding. There's exploring sense of coherence via ongoing international public health and social survey could be an important step to predict mental health of different population. It seems that during global pandemic, it is not enough to provide material resources, but perhaps and even more important, there is a need to enhance the ability of members of the society to comprehend, manage, and give meaning to their chaotic reality. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks so much, Adi, for that lovely presentation and uh, for your reflections on the importance of the sense of coherence uh, related to mental health. I think mental health is one of these issues that continues to get neglected um, and needs to, I think, be really high on global agendas. And so research like this, I think, will help contribute to that because this is certainly one of the issues, many issues that I think many countries are contending with as they start to think about building back better from COVID-19. Uh, what are going to be the long lasting uh, mental health implications, for example, from this uh, pandemic? So thanks so much uh, for sharing your um, analysis across countries. That's two for two. We have <laughs> a bit of a theme going there. Um, I'm going to um, next um, turn to um, a presentation by uh, Mr. Um, Jacopo Bellini, uh, who works as a mental health service coordinator for Travelers um, Health Service Executive um, in Ireland. And this executive is the main healthcare provider in Ireland. Um, and he will de deliver this presentation uh, based on um, the article, A Community Health Partnership Response to Mitigate the Impact of the COVID-19 Pandemic on Travelers and Roma Populations in um, Israel. So I guess you're here um, live. <laughs> so we yes. will proceed and uh, look forward to hearing your presentation. Okay, I will share now my screen. 
So thank you very much for inviting me to uh, this webinar. It's a, a privilege for me to be um, presenting today. And, um, and thank you also for the editors and of the Global Health Promotion um, for the support provided during the uh, publication of this study. So um, my name is Jacopo Villani and I'm from Italy, but I, I live and work in Ireland in Galway. I'm a graduate of the Master in Health Promotion in the National University of Ireland, Galway. And uh, the study that I'm presenting today um, uh, is called the Community Health Partnership Response to Mitigate the Impact of the COVID-19 Pandemic on Travelers and Roma uh, in Ireland. And Travelers and Roma are two ethnic uh, minorities in Ireland, and they are both traditionally nomadic people, and they both share high levels of disadvantage and uh, marginalization. The difference between the two groups is that Irish travelers are uh, indigenous of the island of Ireland. They are around 40,000 people, which is um, less than 1% of the Irish population. While Roma, they are even a smaller group. There are only 5,000 people in Ireland, and they are not from, from Ireland. They come from mainland Europe. And uh, this uh, study was a collaboration between healthcare practitioners, uh, just like myself, and professionals from the NGO sector, working for different NGOs, uh, like uh, Pavi Point Traveler Roma Center and Offaly Traveler Movement. And these NGOs work at, at a grassroots level to, uh, and they advocate for an improvement of travels and Roma living condition and for the respect of travels and Roma and human rights. So I'm going to give uh, just a brief, a brief uh, background for the study. I will briefly touch on the methods used, and then we will talk about uh, the results and some of the recommendations and conclusions. So I think the starting point for this uh, discussion and also for the mitigation strategies that, which were implemented in Ireland is that travelers in Roma experience a higher socioeconomic and health inequities uh, compared to the general uh, population. Uh, in fact, 80% of travelers are unemployed, 40% uh, of travelers live in overcrowded accommodations, and both communities, travelers and Roma, the majority of these communities, they lack water and sanitation and basic uh, facilities. They also, there is also a very high percentage of travelers and Roma who are, uh, who are uh, homeless and live in poverty, and, and they also have uh, very low educational attainment. So, um, there are also different studies uh, which report uh, a higher level, higher prevalence of uh, heart disease, diabetes, and cancer in these uh, communities. So it is evident from these statistics that um, travel as a raw mobility to comply with the public health restrictions uh, in relation to uh, hand hygiene, self-isolation, and, uh, and also social distancing have been uh, curtailed by um, poor uh, uh, social environments, uh, low literacy, and also uh, financial insecurity. And, and that's why NGOs and community uh, and, and health practitioners got together and implemented mitigation strategies to protect these two uh, communities. And fortunately in Ireland, we have strong traveler Roma health uh, infrastructures. In fact, we have six traveler health units all over Ireland. And these units, they sit within the healthcare sector and they fund uh, 27 primary healthcare projects for travelers and three Roma health projects. And these are the epitome of health promotion uh, projects. In fact, these projects, they uh, employ over 300 traveler community health workers and Roma health workers who uh, through outreach work, they bridge the gap between uh, the mainstream health services and vulnerable communities. So they promote health at community level outside of the, of the healthcare sector. And, and it is through these infrastructures and through the collaboration and partnership between NGOs, uh, healthcare professionals, and under the guidance of public health that the mitigation strategies to protect these two groups in Ireland were uh, implemented. And the aim of this study was to examine these interventions, uh, which were implemented to limit inequities to uh, exposure, in exposure to the virus and in access to healthcare. But also the study aims also to explore the contribution of health promotion strategies to minimize the deepening and the, the exacerbation of health um, inequities. And the conceptual framework underpinning this study is the model of social production of disease of Dietrichsen et al, which suggests that um, health inequities are the direct consequence of social position. So people's social position will determine the degree of exposure to uh, health compromising uh, risks uh, and uh, factors at their degree of vulnerability, and then people from different socioeconomic positions will also have different consequences of disease depending on their timeliness 
uh, of access to care. So, uh, but these this inequities can be narrowed by uh, um, de uh, by decreasing the exposure to uh, risks and also by improving the access to healthcare. And it, it is exactly at these two levels that the NGOs and community health partnership in Ireland tried to intervene to mitigate the processes which uh, produce uh, health uh, inequities. And uh, the, the methods used for this study, uh, the approach was a descriptive qualitative approach to provide a detailed account of three community and partnership-led responses, which, was, which were implemented between March and May 2020. And the, the data sources for this study were NGOs briefing, COVID-19 helpline database, multimedia sources, minutes of meeting and observations. And all the uh, co-authors of this study, we all participated firsthand in the implementation of these responses. So we had the privilege of being able to observe how these, how these responses were implemented. And then we use thematic analysis to um, identify the main strategies and interventions uh, implemented. And these are the results of the study. Uh, so this table summarizes the strategies and interventions which were uh, implemented in Ireland to mitigate the deepening of health uh, inequities among travelers and Roma. Uh, so on, the, on, on this line, you can see the different responses um, which, which we analyzed. The first one is the community response in the Eastern region. So these were NGOs working at grassroots level who implemented uh, different uh, interventions such as distribution of hygiene kits, the distribution of food, telephones, and also financial support. The second response is the national COVID-19 Travel and Roma response team, which was a national team comprising over 30 professionals from all over Ireland, from the NGO sector and from the healthcare sector, who uh, met twice a week uh, through teleconferences during the, third three, the first three months of the pandemic. And we shared uh, information about what was going on in different regions, and we discussed priorities and, and, and what needed to be done. Uh, and then the third response is a travel COVID-19 helpline. This also was um, a, a national project. Um, and uh, this helpline provided information to traveler uh, calling the helpline. And also we signposted through this helpline uh, vulnerable cases to community safety net uh, systems. And, uh, and this, these are the strategies, the health promotional strategies employed. So as you can see, all the, the strategies were uh, used by different responses. The most common strategy is the empowerment, although this is limited to the provision of information and also to the improvement of uh, travel to Roma living condition. But also advocacy was quite important and there were uh, very important achievements done by advocacy and lobbying uh, of, uh, of NGOs in collaboration with, with the uh, healthcare professionals. And then of course the partnership approach was key as well for the delivery of these interventions. And this is the list of the interventions um, implemented. Uh, the most common intervention is the provision and distribution of culturally sensitive and literacy friendly communication and also the translation of uh, COVID-19 resources for Roma who didn't speak English. And this um, intervention is very important. In fact, there is a study which uh, was conducted in 2010, which shows that travelers are reporting that poor literacy is one of the most important barriers to access services. So that's why there was a focus on producing uh, this culturally sensitive information. And we will see later a few examples of this type of uh, culturally sensitive communication, which resonated with travelers and Roma uh, culture. So they're, they're, they're considered more effective for this reason. Um, another important set of intervention is the lobbying, which was done by NGOs in, in collaboration with uh, healthcare professionals to change policies. So, and, and the, one of the achievements was the ban on travelers eviction, which was very important in the, cost of, in the context of COVID-19. But also there was a change in, 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 the, in the policies related to, to accommodation. So there was a budget which was dispersed at national level for an improvement of uh, travelers halting site and uh, water and sanitation facilities. And then also the lobbying of NGOs was able to achieve a prioritization of travels and Roma in COVID-19 testing, which is also very important. In fact, these two communities have a, a poor engagement with uh, the services. And then uh, the provision of isolation facilities for Roma also was another intervention. There was a, a hotel uh, in the Dublin area was secured for the self-isolation of Roma people uh, who tested positive to COVID-19 and couldn't um, self-isolate due to hom homelessness or um, overcrowding. So these are the main uh, interventions which were implemented, which can be um, 
uh, grouped in four main categories. So culturally sensitive communication, public health measures, economic and social support, and lobbying for policy change. So these interventions supported by the health promotion strategies of empowerment, advocacy, and partnership were able to mitigate those processes which uh, produce and generate health uh, inequities. And then finally, in the, in the last column, you can see uh, the different uh, sources of inequities addressed, such as uh, uh, access to healthcare and exposure to the virus, um, depending on the, on the different mitigation uh, strategy. And uh, I'm just going to show you a few examples of the culturally sensitive communication which were produced in Ireland. So there were hundreds and hundreds of leaflets, uh, resources, videos produced by travelers, for travelers, by Roma, for Roma. Uh, and uh, and I'm, I'm going to show you just a few seconds of this video. It's, it's a video produced by a, a Pavi Point employee. She's, she's, she's a Roma person who is speaking in her own language to her own community. Vrem să vă mulțumim pentru că vă protejați pe dumneavoastră, rudele și prietenii împotriva coronavirusului. And, uh, and this is also a, a leaflet which was translated uh, for Roma people who didn't speak, who don't speak English. It was translated in Slovak, uh, in Czech, in Romani, Romanian, in so many different languages. Uh, this is another uh, uh, leaflet on COVID-19 and mental health with pictures of travelers which resonate with travelers' culture and system of belief. Uh, this is another um, leaflet as well with do's and don'ts uh, around uh, COVID-19 and how to boost uh, uh, travelers' mental health with uh, um, uh, pictures or, or uh, drawings which, which depict a real uh, typical traveler life scenario. Uh, and this is also another video which I'm not going to show, but it's, it's a traveler talking to travelers uh, about self-isolation. So this, uh, all this culturally sensitive communication was very important. There is another study also where travelers are reporting that uh, culturally sensitive communication would be one of the strategies that they believe uh, will most improve their health. So that's why there was such an important focus on this, on this intervention. So, um, so in co to conclude, I think that COVID-19 pandemic has exposed travelers and Roma vulnerabilities and the interplay between travelers and Roma vulnerabilities with the public health restriction has threatened to exacerbate uh, health inequities. But uh, as this study has shown, there are uh, strategies that uh, an intervention that can be put in place underpinned by health promotion principles and strategies who can contribute to address uh, the challenges of pandemic and then they can uh, minimize the threat of, of uh, improving uh, or increasing health inequities by tackling the multiple routes of uh, virus exposure and by increasing uh, access to healthcare. And then in terms of, in terms of recommendation, I think the, the most important thing would be to engage with minority organizations who are the experts about uh, their culture and what needs to be done. And then also developing a partnership between these organizations and healthcare providers is key. And this, this has been, you know, this study has shown how uh, this is a viable approach to uh, deliver uh, pandemic um, interventions. And then finally, pandemic preparedness plans should consider the wider social economic needs of travelers and Roma, and they should include uh, financial and food support for these communities, improvement of halting sites, but also providing access to internet and hardware for children attending distance, distance learning. So having equity and partnership as, as guiding principle would, uh, will um, ensure that the needs of these communities are properly, uh, properly reflected. So this is my presentation and thank you for listening. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Jacopo. Um, I think you've really helped to um, surface some really important points, including about uh, the need to focus research on otherwise um, invisible um, populations and uh, some of the strategies that were effective, for example, cultural sensitivity of information. But I also took away the combination of strategies that is really needed, uh, which it's not a new thing in health promotion, but I think sometimes happens a little too often where we take a single approach and uh, the need to pair that cultural sensitive approach with community-based partnerships and economic and social support to really um, have an impact. And I also just wanted to um, uh, commend you for your uh, Prezi presentation, which, you know, I don't know if this was deliberate, but I actually 
thought given who you were talking about um, and given how um, we're talking about travelers and, and Roma populations that are very um, on the move um, by definition, your presentation uh, kind of uh, conveyed that. Um, so I don't know if that was uh, deliberate, but anyway, it certainly came through. So uh, well done. So thank, thank you. Thank um, you very much. So um, last but not least, um, il me fait un grand plaisir de vous présenter Valérie Reed. Et puis Valérie euh, travaille au Centre Population et Développement, euh, et, ou qu'on appelle CEPD, <laughs> CEPED, je pense. Et puis, euh, il, euh, il est aussi affilié à l'Université de Paris et il est également affilié à l'Institut de santé et développement, l'Université Cheikh Anta Diop à, à Dakar au Sénégal. Il est co-auteur d'un éditorial qui a été publié en juin euh, qui s'intitule « Quand la réponse mondiale à la pandémie de la COVID-19 » se fait sans la promotion de la santé. Alors, ça me fait un plaisir de te revoir, Valérie, et je te passe la parole. Merci. Merci, Erika. Um, I'm not sure how I need to, to speak in, in French, English, or Spanish, or Wolof, as maybe English. OK, I will, I will, I will do in, uh, in English. So, uh, so first, uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to present our paper uh, at uh, this uh, webinar. As I'm speaking the last after these three excellent presentations, I imagine that you are all tired and ready to go back to, to the sea or to the beach or whatever you are. So I will be very uh, uh, short uh, and because today is also a day off, at least for us in, in Senegal, as you maybe know. So I will be short as our editorial um, <clears throat> was. So Erika asked uh, uh, Linda Cambon uh, uh, to write this editorial and she was kind enough to involve us in the reflection. Indeed, uh, we had the very exigent ideas informally, particularly concerning our concern about the management of the pandemic in France, but also in the French speaking world, at least in, in West Africa where, where I am. Therefore, the, the collective writing of this editorial was a great opportunity with Linda uh, leadership to put in writing how thoughts, which unfortunately are global, are definitely not limited to the French speaking world. So suppose the neglected of health promotion approach is surprising in countries where there are no untaught like uh, Canada. In that case, it is not a surprise for me in the French speaking world where public health is still dominated by a vertical, biomedical and pastorian approach. The COVID-19 pandemic was once again perceived as a war, to use the word of certain political authorities with a little training in public health and science again, against a virus are not as an epidemic revealing social inequalities in health and the social determinants of health. Thus, we have seen clinicians, modelers, epidemiologists, pastorian, and uh, infectious disease specialists maintain and increase their power in decision making. Therefore, therefore, the solution proposed have reflected this vertical and biomedical vision, forgetting almost everywhere in the world, patient, civil society, community organization, local elected, elected representative, family physician, participatory approach, etc., etc. In France, for example, the scientific committee to fight against COVID-19 did not have any public health experts at the beginning, so let alone health promotion experts. In Senegal, the scientific committee was never convened and the planning of the response was centralized and sectionalized. The community health department of the Minister for Health was not invited on to the first planning meeting in March 1920. So our editorial is therefore a new player for health promotion, a new, new player, like we say uh, in the past, the new public health, so the new, new public health, no, it's a new, new player for health promotion. So the older uh, among us must surely be in disaster because this is the advocacy that they have spent the entire a professional career on, even before the Ottawa Charter. Perhaps it's time for the older one to give way to the younger one, because 
the failure of this old public health is apparent. I'm surprised that people over, let's say, 70 are still accepting position of responsibility in the fight against the pandemic when they could be making way for younger people, younger than me, of course, and advising them on the basic of their long experience. When we see the first course that the new WHO Health Academy seems to be preparing, we are worried about the permanence of this biomedical vision of public health. Moreover, the fact that the only solution seems to rely today on vaccine is very worrying in terms of prevention and health promotion. It is becoming urgent, at least for me, to inform and train people on health promotion approach to become a reality and are no longer confined to our academic books. But how can the, that can be done? Let's hope that the younger one will be more effective than us, at least than me. So that's, that was just my talk and very short as our editorial uh, was. And, and thanks, uh, Erika, for, for the floor. Up to you. Thank you so much, Valerie. This is Diane. I'm uh, taking over and moderating. Um, it's just really interesting to hear. I think every sentence you had was extremely powerful. Um, and I'm going to go back and read your editorial again now that you've presented it. Um, so we'll, we'll take questions now. I also have some questions, but um, I'm uh, happy to see what uh, what's in the chat. Um, and also if any um, if Anna or Alexandra also want to share anything from the chat. Uh, maybe in the meantime, um, Valerie, I really took from your presentation uh, the point about advocacy. Um, I think whether we're the veteran generation or the young generation, I think what we've learned in this pandemic is how much we as health promotion, public health people have to speak up. Uh, we have to make ourselves heard and be around the table when policies are being established. I think maybe some of us used to being academic or some are used to being practitioners, but not used to being with the policymakers. But here the policymakers, at least what I saw and really needed to have input from professionals and academics and not necessarily knew that there were resources there. So the issue of speaking up, being advocates, um, as you mentioned, the generals that are taking over for the war, um, can be, be at the table with them. Um, so that was an important reflection I got from you. And I think it's something we've experienced and you, you put it so, so well. Um, and uh, also, um, unless if you'd like to respond to that, um, and if you have any response to that. Um, and also, uh, there's somebody in the waiting room, I'll let them in. Um, but if not, in the meantime, I also would like to um, just uh, a couple of reflections I had and a question for the other speakers. Um, Jacopo, uh, again, thank you so much for your dynamic presentation. Um, I was, while you were presenting, I was asking myself about the issue of trust, the public trust. It seems to me that you use partnerships and participation is one of the important tools. You know, we teach that, we try to practice, it doesn't always happen. I was wondering to what extent was that maybe the secret of your success or what else? How were you able to build trust when normally there might not be trust between some of the groups that you're talking about and the established health system? Maybe some of them are afraid of um, their identity being found, maybe you know, certain countries, you'd have a population like this being worried about being transported so or deported. So if you can just give us a little bit of your reflection on that, I would, I would really yes. enjoy hearing you speak about thank, that. Thank you, Diane. Yes, no, that's a very good question. In fact, there is a huge mistrust between travelers, Roma and uh, health authorities and authorities in general. So that's, you know, the issue of trust is, is huge. Uh, but as I, as I said in the presentation, in Ireland, we have a strong travel and Roma health infrastructures. So there are this, this, this partnership, which is present in Ireland since the 1990s. So it's over 20 years that we have uh, travel organizations and Roma organization working in collaboration with the healthcare sector. So uh, as soon as the pandemic hit, 
this uh, in Ireland, the first you know case of COVID-19 was detected in Ireland. These infrastructures mobilized uh, very fast uh, to you know to, to to design strategy. So so the issue of trust was uh, overcome by these uh, infrastructures by having uh, travel organizations, NGOs working at grassroots who are really the gatekeeper to the to these communities and they know the community very well. And there are a lot of travelers in Roma working with this, this organization. So uh, the issue of trust was, you know, was tackled in, uh, in this way. And, 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 and that's why also uh, there was a huge uh, focus on creating uh, messages which resonated uh, with uh, travelers in Roma culture so that they could trust, they could understand and trust um, the healthcare professional. But you're right in saying that the issue of trust is huge. It is, uh, in fact, a lot of Roma uh, are still very hesitant in taking the vaccine because there are, you know, in the, in the past, there are bad experiences uh, by, by Roma who were uh, deported and who were, uh, you know, they, they, they just were uh, abused by authorities in, in mainland Europe. So there is a huge hesitancy in that. Uh, but yeah, but the strength of this partnership uh, uh, was able to overcome, uh, you know, these uh, these these challenges, and also the synergy between the the, the health professionals uh, who knew how the healthcare system works, and you know, the, the knowledge of uh, NGOs from the grassroots also was very important for for the development of these mitigation strategies. So it sounds to me that the uh, established relationship that was in place when the pandemic broke out yeah. really really was to the benefit yes. of being able to continue the work together. So it's another lesson learned that we have to build on what we are doing in normal, when, if there is a new normal, uh, because it will, it's, it's the right thing to do and we'll carry on when there's crisis, that's important. And exactly. another thing that bring, comes to mind is that so many countries are, are challenged with the Roma populations that maybe some of your lessons learned can be carried over to other countries. So hopefully yes. your article will resonate with others as well. Great, thank yes. you. Um, I have more questions, I'm seeing in, in chat if there are any other questions. Um, and so I see there's a question from Muriel uh, for Dr. Reed, Reed. I'm sorry for mispronouncing your last name, uh, Valerie. How to practically and radically move forward and act about what you mentioned when the same people, often not diversified in public health, health professional oriented, are at the most powerful decision-making tables. So what is your reflection on that question? Yeah, just, uh, I need to, what can I say? So first, I have not the answer of that. If not, I will not be here today with you. Uh, uh, we definitely need to to explain that and and to take the power. But taking the power is is never easy. Easier to, to to say like I try to do than 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 to act. And we have seen in all the country in the world that we are still with this biomedical approach, with a physician clinician who are in the power on health and, and public health. So. We, we maybe need to, to first start to, to improve and change the way that we train uh, uh, our, our um, academics and, and professional health. The, the level of training in health promotion and, uh, is, is very, very low everywhere in the, in the, in the planet. Um, and <clears throat> still many, uh, if not all the countries, uh, 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 put a lot of money in in the Ministry of Health or in the Ministry of, of uh, uh, Caring and not the Ministry of Health. So um, in most of the country, we have less than two or three percent of the of the health budget for health promotion and health education and health prevention. That's that's a major problem. And just look at the numbers and the figure of the money that is spent on vaccination and developing the vaccination since the last months, uh, comparing to the level of uh, money that is a law for health system stretching, for example. There is, so I have not, I, we have a paper on that for, for the moment, I can send you the, the figure after that. Uh, but that that's crazy how we are still back to the same, I don't know how to you call that in, in English, but that the, the reflex, you know, we all have the, the this basic reflex coming back to the to the to the, to the medicine, coming back to the virus, coming back to the pastorian, 
and we need to change that and that's that's definitely uh, not an easy uh, task so first train and explain uh, and try to 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 push forward but the problem is that for the moment you have some countries where they try to reform the system but that the same people who are the power that try to reform and they don't want to change too much their their place for example in france most of the power are under the end of the physician who are at the hospital practitioner and they are trained in public health but not in health promotion and they are mostly focused on on epidemiology and and uh, that's that's definitely a, a major uh, problem to, to to move on so you're saying that we need to have more training on health promotion also among the clinicians and among those who are making some of the decisions that they are more aware of health promotion but also for the health promotion professionals and academics for training they have to train them to take on more responsibly and to step up to advocate more and be there with the others okay thank you yes. well there's and a good more, question from money. margaret sorry i'm sorry more, more money also for that huh? well That's of what course what of was course. quite surprising at least for me is that this is not the first time that we have an epidemic and we are responding with the same way that we're responding to epidemic since always. And that that's that's a shame for all of us. Yeah, and it's also it's like a big surprise <laughs> when we shouldn't be surprised, we should be ready. Yeah. So Margaret Berry, uh, the president of the IUHP has a question for all the panelists. And I would like to open it up to all the participants because we have uh, the amount of people that we can discuss together. Um, she writes thanks to all the panel for the interesting presentations. As a general point, it would be useful to consider how the role of health promotion in pandemic preparedness can be strengthened, including the importance of addressing mental health impacts at a population level. So I think, uh, Valerie, you gave us a reflection, maybe Adi um, and Jacopo or any of the other participants here, uh, you're welcome to join in the conversation. How can we do a better job? How can we strengthen and address the importance of, of health promotion, including mental health promotion at the population level. What can we do better? So who would like to take it? Adi, would you like to reflect on this? Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I, I can speak from, from the, the perspective of the, the um, uh, data that we found that it was very, very interesting that while the um, uh, the perceived social support and the level of trust that we all talk about it was a, a lower predict predicted uh, of anxiety and mental health than a, a sense of coherence. And I think it is very, very interesting. Um, it seemed that, that during this uh, 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 this time of con trying to control this pandemic, uh, politician and uh, uh, even the health promoter uh, uh, um, 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 professional um, did a lot to, to confuse the, the public. Uh, very uh, inconsistent, uh, um, um, um description of the of the there is uh, the reasons the 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 uh, how to control it many many opinion many different opinion and uh, i think it um if if we can keep in mind that uh, uh to 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 build a strong sense of coherence, to to uh, um, to help the population to better understand, to 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 have a, a, a sense of meaningful what is going on the uh, what is going on around them. Uh, all th all this is not less important than uh, support, than trust, and maybe uh, even more. Thank you for that. So again, the uh, salutogenic model is, uh, is there for empowering the population is what you're saying. And we should be working yeah. on this even during, uh, during our new normal, particularly. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jacopo, do you have any reflection yeah. on that? 
Yes, well, um, I think for socially uh, disadvantaged groups and for mar marginalized groups, I think uh, the most important thing in, in, in relation to mental health is to be able to uh, to uh, have access to basic resources. So, for example, in the case of travelers, travelers are people that are nomadic. So being confined in their homes, in their holding site was very stressful uh, during the, the first lockdown. And also not being able to go to a grocery store or not having money to purchase food. So, you know, so that's created stress and worry. And so I think the most important thing for these groups, for marginalized groups, is to tackle social inequities. So being able to, uh, to, to comply with the public health restrictions, to stay at home, but being able to, you know, to, to, to live. And, and a lot of these communities and individuals, they didn't have access to a telephone, they didn't have access to transport, they couldn't move, they couldn't phone, uh, they couldn't access, you know, health, uh, 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 health uh, care um, uh, appointments. So, all this has an impact in mental health. So for these communities, I feel you know the most important thing is to tackle social inequities, uh, and this will have a positive knock-on effect in in their mental health. And we uh, implemented different strategies and different interventions to improve travelers' mental health. For example, during during the lockdown, we uh, implemented a, a, a step and fitness challenge for traveler men. So it was a physical activity intervention. Uh, uh, aimed at improving uh, mental health during a very challenging time. So that's, that was a strategy which, which we did. And it was so we shared you know, a different workout routine through a WhatsApp group. And it was a way to uh, just to, you know, to support the community uh, during a very, very challenging time and to promote positive mental health through physical activity. So it was, it was an interesting approach. Great. And I, I'd like to add also in Israel, um, one of the important groups that we neglected until too far into the pandemic were the healthcare workers, uh, their mental health and their issues, um, their, their, their concern about being, um, about, about contracting COVID, their families who didn't want them to come home maybe because they were afraid that they were going to bring a COVID home, their communities. They were working 24 seven, many of them. And, uh, and it didn't surface till much later and they were to be taking care of others' mental health. So it took a while. And I think that's another group that we have to, it's a, I would, they're, they're, and they're so upfront that they're almost invisible because nobody considered it. So I think that's another important group that we have to give special attention to their health promotion as well. Um, and also we looked at the different religious groups in Israel that um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of judgmental um, public opinion against them. Um, if, they, if going to school was the most important thing more than even getting sick um, and going to special religious schools, the rest of the country was very judgmental and very angry at them. And uh, it was difficult to bridge that gap, very difficult, and it created more disparities in many ways. So I think um, health promotion and the tools that we have for partnership, for bridging, for listening, um, for reaching out, um, and uh, for, for doing, having joint partnerships, I think would really, really work as a benefit here. And I think Valerie also wants to reflect on this question as well. You have your hand up, Valerie? Yeah. Um... Two points. The first one is, is about the, 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 the question uh, on the fact that, that health promotion professionals were active, actively involved or not. And, and at least we have seen in many countries uh, where uh, NGOs or community health workers have been uh, in, involved in many, many uh, disease programs, they, they, like HIV at least, but we, there has been a forgetting again in this epidemic at the beginning. And during the first months, everybody forget them, and they are still coming back to their their vertical uh, approach uh, and biomedical and funding hospital and blah 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 blah, and they, they forget that even if the the fight against, for example, HIV were very effective in, in the past. The second point that I want to make is the question of of equity that we talk about. Uh, uh, this afternoon in, in a few of the presentation, and as you know, uh, better than me, that's the, the, the key value of health promotion. And we all know that, And but people who are on board for fighting against infectious are on the train on that. They, they even 
have difficulties to understand the, dif the difference between equality and equity, and we still need to 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 explain that. And what was my surprise also that we all. Uh, 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 be sure that COVID-19 will increase the inequalities, or at least will 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 be a challenge for for the for the worst of. But nobody have done at the beginning of the pandemic to take into account that uh, uh, um, unfair distribution yeah. the burden of the disease. But we are all trained on that. So we have done uh, a few months ago. Uh, uh, a scoping review, a very large uh, literature review uh, to see how equity has been uh, uh, taking into account in two major uh, interventions to fight against epidemics, which is uh, uh, contact tracing and uh, testing. And after all the hundreds of paper that we, 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 we look for, we didn't find any paper that talk about equity. Uh, and that's mean nobody who implemented and formulated intervention in, in for contact tracing and testing, which all will know no, that is important for COVID-19. Nobody talk about that, nobody plan about that. But we have thousands of tools and we are good in health promotion of toolbox, uh, uh, but they didn't read that. And they, they start with their reflex. We need to have a universal approach and blah, blah, blah. And they, they forget that, that topic. So we, are in a research process for the moment, trying to, to talk with them. Even humanitarian organizations uh, um, forget that. So we have uh, implemented the research in few countries, <clears throat> trying to talk with them at the national level of with the people who are formulating the intervention to try to understand why they forget that. What does that mean for them? And how can we, can we, can we improve the way that for the next epidemic, we will again not forget that that major issue that Michael Marmot will always tell us that we always forget that. So what's my point, sorry. Thank you, thank you. By the way, the summit that I mentioned will be in October, Michael Marmot will be talking about that. So again, recommend that you come to that summit and listen in and join us, enjoy in the conversation. Um, Jacobo, you have a question. Um, uh, Anna, Anna Walsh asks, how, have any estimates been made on how many Roma and, tra and travelers lived and long-term health outcomes due to COVID have been saved by the interventions? Have you done any uh, estimation? Good question. No, we don't have actually an, es an estimate of that. Uh, however, I can say that in the first two waves of COVID-19 in Ireland, there were very few travelers in Roma, positive cases and hospitalization and death, very few cases. So we could say that uh, fortunately, this, I mean, this, this intervention were quite successful. However, in the third uh, phase, in the first wave, in the third wave of COVID-19, uh, travelers in Roma have been disproportionately affected and the, the latest uh, epi epidemiological uh, statistics um, show that there, there have been uh, more outbreaks uh, among travelers in Roma uh, compared to the general population. Uh, and so they have been hit quite hard in the third wave. But I don't have, we don't have estimates uh, on, on how many lives have been saved uh, by the intervention at the beginning of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So from Asma Shaban Abdel Sama, um, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name. Uh, we have a comment that I think we need to improve health literacy in our societies as well, so as to be able to evaluate the status quo and being aware of the urgency to put a vision and plan to apply it on ground. Um, thank you for that comment. I'd just also like to um, update that the, uh, the MPOL initiative or measuring public and organizational health literacy. It's a European project, but it's going to be spreading around different parts of the globe. Is look at health literacy and also has questions on COVID-19. So we're asking people uh, what, how they access the information. Is it available to them? Is it understandable? Is it usable? Um, and looking at the, the diversity and looking at the disparities as well. And we see a social gradient, not surprising to any of you here. Um, you know, we know it's dependent upon income and education, and there's some gender issues sometimes in countries. So um, thank you for the comment. We need to monitor. And most importantly, it's a basis for intervention because that's in the, in the end what we do with health promotions. We want to make a difference. So thank you for that comment. And uh, thank you, Valerie, for giving us the reviews, um, the comment, the uh, links in the, in the uh, chat. I direct you all to that. 
And IHPE, either it's Anna or Alexandra, is asking in which countries does health promotion professionals were actively involved in creating response to COVID-19? So if that's a question, um, any of you would like to speak up? Um, we've seen that uh, we see that Ireland and Israel and uh, and uh, Valerie, the country you come from, is is involved. Uh, and um, so any other countries that want to either speak up here or uh, put uh, information in the chat, I think it's a wonderful question. It is actually what we aimed to do in our article. It began as a as a um, as a, a challenge to have a compendium of health promotion responses during COVID-19. And from that, our article was a result, but we really would like to get a compendium going and get a um, maybe a clearinghouse of different ways in which there's health promotion, uh, health promoters and health promotion professionals were involved uh, in COVID and are. Um, so maybe we can think of a, that's another role for IUHPE to, to coordinate some of this information. But in the meantime, if any of you would like to share and take yourselves off mute, um, you can or don't have to open up your camera. And we'd love to hear from you as a response to that question as well. Okay. Well, as we wait for some of those responses, um, I think I'd like to ask all of our panelists um, if any of you, besides having maybe a closing comment, but also what's your silver lining? What would you like to see sustained as a result of COVID-19 after hopefully, hopefully, hopefully we will find our, we'll be at our last major wave. I think we're all, we all know we're going to be living with COVID for a long time, but if we can get over the major waves, what would you like to, what, did, what would you like to take away that is something you would maintain, sustain, and like to see continue as a result of COVID-19? So I'm going to go around the, where I see um, Adi. What would you like to, to see maintained and continue on that began during COVID? Mm. Difficult, difficult, very difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't warn you all ahead of time. <laughs> yes, yes. Let me think about it. We can come back to you. Okay. Yeah. Jacopo, do you have a response to that question? Sorry for yes, the surprise uh, question. No, that's okay. I, I'm, no, I'm just, I, we know as health promoters, we're optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, travelers are in Ireland are one of the most discriminated group in the country. Uh, so they have experienced uh, over the decades a huge amount of discrimination, marginalization, uh, bullying and harassment. And it, it took a pandemic to improve travelers' halting sites, to improve water and sanitation facilities. See, these are basic facilities, water and sanitation. So it took a pandemic for the government to disperse more funds and to local authorities to implement uh, these improvements of traveler halting sites. So what I would like to see is that you know, every travel halting site, every traveler and Roma housing has proper facilities uh, because you can, we can't wait for the next pandemic to have you know, an improvement of these living conditions. And we have seen that this you know, poor living environment, suboptimal uh, housing are uh, a huge threat, uh, a huge risk for, uh, for COVID-19, but also for any other uh, epidemic. So I think you know, what I would like to see is that uh, from now on, uh, travel halting site and travel's living condition are uh, improved and sustained. Uh, because, you know, if, as we all know, if we tackle inequities uh, and if we improve the, the health conditions and the living condition of the most marginalized groups, we will all benefit. So, you know, so tackling inequity is, is just a goal for everyone. So I guess I would like to see, yeah, an improvement in, in travels in Roma socioeconomic uh, conditions. So you think that's an opportunity that was created through the COVID. Thank you. Uh, Valerie? So what I would like to maybe to dream is that we understand that prevention is better than, than care and cure, that we need to, to, to have uh, maybe less money uh, in the hospital and more in the prevention. But that, that prevention is not only vaccination. 
and prevention is more than vaccination. That vaccination is is very very important, but that's the only not the only uh, uh, intervention that we need to implement. If not, uh, we will have uh, some 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 trouble first. And second, that if we want to fight against health inequalities uh, uh, and and for equity, we need to formulate and plan our interventions before according to that need and not after uh, uh, because if not we will always continue to see the the, the 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 same the same trouble so let's start by plan according to to uh, to equities and to to uh, adapt our intervention according to the needs of the subgroup of the population and then we can implement it that's my two. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what I'd like to take away is uh, there's a lot more conversation going on internationally uh, about health, um, not just from health promoters. Others are speaking about health promotion, about health literacy, taking interest in what we do, I think. Um, and uh, I think a lot of more partnerships were created, so I'd like to keep those going. Uh, some amazing amount of research has come out because there a lot of other things couldn't happen. So many researchers were, were really publishing more than ever. So we're learning more. So I think if we can keep that going as well. And the digital communication, look at what we have here. I think if it wasn't for COVID and Corona, I'm not sure we will be having these kinds of discussions among us on Zoom or other digital platforms who have become the new norm for communication. So I know that's going to keep going. I know for my staff around the country, they're coming, they're going to be coming to our meetings less physically, and we're going to keep the conversation going also digitally to keep it to maintain conversation and save lots of time. Um, those are just some things I'm taking away. And plus, as I mentioned, the digital health promotion that we're doing and the, and many, many groups are responding very well to it. And we would not have had that if it wasn't for COVID. So that's some of my takeaways from the, from the pandemic. Adi, anything you'd like to add? Yes, yes. I think the pandemic was an opportunity to understand um, how can all of us uh, um, are living in a very uh, um, rapid change reality. Uh, um, and and we all adjust, we, we all uh, uh, adjusted to, to this quick changes and in everything we know and and we're still alive and we're still here and uh, uh, we learn how to, to, uh, to benefit from it. So I hope that we'll continue to, to learn. So now that the, the, the humans are resilient, <laughs> if necessary. So I have to, I'd like okay. to end with two um, contributions we have in the chat that just seem like a lovely way to, to, to end this amazing session. Uh, Sarah Mordechai has said Zoom, meaning she would like to keep Zoom. People seem to be kinder to others. The understanding that the world is a small village and we all depend on each other. And I think that's a really important takeaway from COVID. Um, if we didn't know it before, we know it now. And Asma has said that I hope after ending this pandemic to see a more improved health services, better living conditions, especially to those who lost people due to COVID. The, the pandemic also for refugees everywhere, as they're the most, the groups who are suffering most. And I, I appreciate that very much. And also again, we've got a new health issue the long haulers for Corona. We're gonna need more support and a new health issue that will be developing more ways in which we can help and support them. A new health topic, a health behavior, health promotion, health empowerment. So with that, um, I mean, actually just come right to the, the last minute and um, Anna from the IOHPE, who we would like to thank you, Anna, and Alexandra and the staff at IOHP for making this possible. Um, she's thanking us for inspiring presentations, for, their, for sharing our insights and for the time and effort consecrated. So thank you all for your participation. Um, let's keep going and let's keep submitting abstracts. Please share what you're doing uh, with Global Health Promotion Journal. Um, stay involved in IUHPE. You're all welcome. Go on to the website of IUHP. At least I can give you a commercial, as we say, for um, have, getting involved in the Health Literacy Global Working Group. There's other global working groups, so I think you'll really enjoy seeing if you're not involved. And let's not forget, 
Last, next year in Montreal, we have a world conference. So far, it's going to be hybrid. Some of you who are local can probably participate for sure. And uh, others, of course, digital. So stay well. Get vaccinated if you haven't yet. And let's stay in touch. Thank you all so much for your participation. And thank the panelists for all your preparation and involvement. And thanks thank so you. much, IUHP staff, for making this possible.